Thanks for the invitation. Uh, everybody hear me? Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, this is joint work with Alex Wancha. Uh, Alex was here in that great year, 11-12, uh, and he came back in the summer of 13. And we had a couple projects that uh, we wanted to work on. Um, one of them actually was good that we didn't work on it because it was a 30-year-old question of mine that it turned out that somebody else had just answered, <laughs> uh, which we found out later. But uh, when Alex got here, he said, oh, forget all those other things. I really want to work on this. So this, this is the project. It's, it's uh, path products on projective space. Maybe, I don't know if this S should be there, projective space. OK, so, um, so we're going to let PN be the space of paths. So these are maps from gamma from the unit interval into CPN that have their endpoints on RPN. So gamma of 0 and gamma of 1 are both in RPN. Uh, and what we want to do is uh, find the ring structure. Find the ring. Uh, the homology of this path space. Uh, with Z2 coefficients. And the product, the product is the, uh, I don't know, we call it, it's, I think it's obvious what the product should be. It's the, it's the Pontryagin, in, in this paper it's called the Pontryagin Chaz Solon product. I think that's too long <laughs> for a name, but uh, so maybe I'll, ju I'll just call it the path product. Um, so, um, so this is the project. Uh, this, to, com to compute uh, th the homology and also the ring structure on this, uh, let me uh, give a little bit of motivation. I, let me also add, this is definitely Z2 here. Um, that's not just the easy way out. I mean, <laughs> it is definitely the easy way out. But also, um, this makes sense because uh, if you're talking about a real projective space, uh, the ring structure of this it has a ring structure that makes sense over Z2 that uh, you don't see if you use integer coefficients anyway. But everything will be with Z2. Uh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> they all have the same topology. Uh, it doesn't matter. Well, I have to be strong to do this. All right, so, um, so here's a little bit of motivation. So we want to expand string topology to incorporate paths. Of this type, paths of type P and M. So paths on M with boundaries in N. Uh, so that's just, uh, and sort of more specifically, let's suppose if M is closed, and let's say oriented, although we're Z2, so maybe it doesn't matter, uh, manifold, then there's, a, there's an isomorphism from the Hamiltonian Fleur homology of the cohead. I'll, I'll, I'll write it all down, and then I'll say what it all is. So this is the pair of paths. And then I have to list the names. OK, so this is due to uh, on down below Schwartz, uh, Cohen, S. Baranoff. Solomon Faber, uh, Viterbo, and others. 
So this is a well-known isomorphism, although it wasn't quite right the first time. <laughs> but um, so th this is the Hamiltonian Fleur homology. This is the cotangent bundle of M, which has a natural symplectic structure. This is the pair pants product on that. And this is the homology. LM is, is the loop space, uh, maps from S1 and M. So the free loop space. And uh, the product over here is the chas sullen product. product. And that is a ring isomorphism. Although there's some tricky things about it. <coughs> okay, so, so the analogous thing then, oh, and I should have said what the, uh, the Hamiltonian here is the, uh, the kinetic energy. Okay, so, um, all right, so now let N in M be a closed submanifold. Then the cotangent, the co-normal bundle, co-normal bundle of, of, of N in M, the co-normal bundle. It's the space of all covectors that annihilate the tangent space to N in M. Okay? Uh, so this is an exact Lagrangian. In um, the cotangent bundle of M, which is naturally symplectic. And uh, then there's an isomorphism, not, not yet a ring isomorphism, I don't think, in the literature, but between the wrap floor homology of uh, the co-normal bundle of N and M with the homology of this path space, P and M. So uh, this is due to uh, bun, don, below. There's three of them in this one. Portolori, Schwartz, and also uh, Abu Zaid, Fidel. Uh, so this is not as rings, but just uh, an isomorphism um, uh, as modules. And uh, so what are these things? This is the wrapped floor homology. Wrapped floor homology. With a half pair of pants product. Half POP product. POP product. So this is a, a disk. Three points on the Lagrangian This. Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on a minute. <laughs> let, let me leave this out. So, th th so th these people prove that this isomorphism is exists, and it is expected. It is expected that the, the ring structures will also be isomorphism. So, the ring structure here is with this half pair of pants product, and the ring structure over here is the thing that I'm talking about computing today. So, this is the um, the ring structure. This is with the half pair of pants product, and this is with the uh, Pontryagin Chaz Sullivan product. Uh, Alex said he was surprised that you know nobody had even proved it. It was basically the same proof, but um, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, so so this this is a little motivation again. So it's a, an attempt to to extend, right? So th this is this is the thing that we computed here. All right, so uh, the method is uh, Morse theory. Maybe we should go over here. Let's see.
Okay, so we have, uh, so our space is Pn, again, Pn is paths from 0, 1 to Cpn, and 0, 1, the boundary goes to Rpn. And uh, so on these paths, we have the energy function. So uh, E from Pn to the real numbers. The energy of a path is one half. It's, it's the uh, kinetic energy, in one half the integral of uh, gamma dot squared dt. So uh, this energy function has the property that the uh, critical points are, are the closed geodesics, not the closed geodesics, the geodesics parameterized proportional to arc length. Um, so, um, and we really want to use not the energy function, but the square root of the energy function. Uh, Pn. So F is the square root of the energy function. Um, they have the same Morse theory. They have the same critical points. They have the same indices, but uh, this one, uh, this function F has better additive properties. Doesn't really matter a whole lot. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to compute uh, compute this ring uh, using Morse theory. Um, uh, with its energy function, and uh, in order in order for this to make sense, we have to pick a metric. So we're going to pick the Fubini study metric on on projective space. Okay, so given the metric, that gives us we can measure the lengths of uh, we can measure the lengths of vectors, and we can compute the energy of this. Path now, uh, of course, I should point out that the homology, the homology and the ring structure, do not depend on the function. The homology and the ring structure do not depend. on uh, the function or the metric. However, uh, a, a, a correct choice of the function or a correct choice of the metric will make the Morse theory uh, work really very nicely. So, so a good choice, good choice, a good choice of a function uh, yields a nice Morse theory. And in this particular case, uh, the Morse theory that it yields is, is the nicest thing it could possibly be. It's, um, it has the property that uh, the homology is, um, homolog all the cl homology classes are represented by smooth submanifolds. Uh, all the critical points are Morse bot. Uh, the, the, it turns out to be a perfect Morse function, and it turns out that the product is actually defined on the chain level. So I'll come back and say all of those things again. But, but again, for this choice, uh, everything works out really, really beautifully. Okay, so um, so let me just naively describe the product. I think probably most of you know what the product is. Maybe you should just skip this. Anybody want to see what the product is? Okay. Yes, okay, so, so here's a naive description of the product. So it, the product is a product on the homology of this path space, right? With Z2 coefficients. <laughs> Always Z2 coefficients, right? So, so here's, here's how we describe the product. Um, so suppose that you have two cycles. So suppose alpha is a cycle that's uh, parameterized on a, on a smooth manifold. So U is a manifold. And suppose beta is a cycle that's parameterized on some other manifold. So I'm assuming that these are both submanifolds. Uh, 
manifolds, manifolds, not submanifold, but just some smooth manifold. So they're parameterized using submanifolds. And then we also suppose that uh, um, to take evaluation at one composed with alpha. So evaluation, there's two evaluation maps. The path space goes evaluation at zero and evaluation at one. Uh, but by gamma just goes to gamma of zero and gamma of one. Those are the evaluation maps. So suppose the evaluation of alpha at one uh, is transverse to the evaluation at zero of beta. So if those, these are both, this is a map. This is a map from u into RPN. This is a map from v into RPN. And if those are transverse, if this symbol means transverse, then, uh, then let's call W the set of all UV such that, um, such that um, alpha of U at 1 is beta of V at 0. Then this is a submanifold of u cross v. This is a submanifold of u cross v. And we can define the product on the chain level as follows. Uh, so the definition of so alpha, let me help make the product like this. Alpha product with beta is represented by the following class. It's represented by uh, all the paths of the form. So this is a map. I'm going to write this down. Tell me where to write this. So it's, it's the class of alpha star beta. So, so alpha star beta is a, pa is, a, is a map from W to Pn. So this is going to be a cycle parameterized on W. And it's given by alpha dot beta of uv is equal to alpha of u followed by beta of v. So this, this, is, this is a naive definition, right? So you have, uh, it depends upon the assumption that these two are transverse. Right? So basically, you, you, you take, so uh, let's say alpha is a bunch of paths, right? And beta is a bunch of paths. Then you take all of the paths alpha followed by beta, where alpha of 1 is beta of 0. So you stick together all the ones that can stick together, and you leave the other ones out. And this works out very nicely if, if, if these are manifolds and this is transverse. Okay, now this is. Yeah, yes, you do have to reparameterize. Yeah, I left that out. Yes, yes. No, that's good. Yeah. Um, and there is, yeah, there's a good way to reparameterize too. But. So this is, this is sort of a naive definition. Uh, I, I could give you a um, more rigorous definition, but I don't think it conveys what the meaning of the product is as well as the naive definition. Also, in most of the cases where I'm talking about, because the Morse theory is so nice, we can actually use the naive definition. The naive definition is correct under the assumption that these are transverse. Um, and uh, I might also add that there, is, that there is a rigorous definition that doesn't involve anything more complicated than uh, the Tom class of uh, the tangent bundle of, um, of the submanifold M. And there's no shrieking or anything like that. It can all be defined in, in very simple terms. But anyway, um, I think this is a good way to think about what it is. So this is the product. Um, I should say what the degree, I should give you a quiz and ask you what is the degree of the product, right? So the product H, HK of the path from Pn cross Hj of Pn. And what do you get? H sub what? J plus K minus N. I heard somebody say the right answer, right? It's J plus K minus N because, uh, because of this intersection condition, right? This, this transverse intersection inside, uh, again, um, we're assuming that uh, 
we're assuming that alpha of, of u and beta of alpha of u of one and beta of v of zero are both inside RPN, right? So it's an n-dimensional manifold. That's where we have minus n. So this is the intersection <coughs> condition. It gives you the minus n. Okay, so uh, <coughs> that's the definition of the product. And I, I also want to point out that um, <coughs> if it's the case, maybe this, if I see some of you still look a little puzzled. Maybe this will make things more clear. So suppose, for example, that the following thing, suppose that, and this will turn out to be <coughs> the case in some of the um, cycles that we're talking about, the value situation at the point zero composed with beta. So this is a, this is a map from u, or maybe this is from v, right, v. to um, rpn. So this, again, I'm, I'm assuming that this is a submanifold. If this is a submanifold, uh, then uh, we can ask that this be submersive, is submersive. Everybody knows what that means. It means that the derivative map maps the tangent space here onto the tangent space here. So if, if this map is subversive, then uh, for any alpha at all, this is always going to be transverse. Right? So, so evaluation at one uh, composed with alpha is transverse to evaluation at zero composed with beta for any alpha whatsoever. So the transversality condition is, is met for any alpha. For any alpha. And we can define we can define the product on the chain level, completely on the chain level, and it's it's correct. <laughs> so so it is true that uh, for any alpha whatsoever, then it's just uh, it's it's given by this formula. So uh, So uh, alpha, the product of alpha with beta is, is represented by, again, this is the set of, the set of all um, halves of the form So this is the so gamma dot tau. So this is a, this is the uh, composition of two paths um, such that uh, gamma is in the image of alpha. Uh, beta is in the image of I'm sorry, tau is in the image of gamma, and Gamma of one is equal to tau of two. Okay, so in other words, if you have if you have a class uh, beta such that this is subversive onto RPN, then you can just define this is this is a correct definition of the of the uh, of the product. It's just defined. Did I, did I write it correctly? Beta. Right, okay. Right now, yeah, 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 yeah. Is that right now? All right. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so again, it, it makes sense. You can think about it on the chain level. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about Morse theory and a technique which I don't know. Uh, I was familiar with, but Alex never heard of. And this is a nice Morse theory. So we get to talk about nice Morse theory because of our nice choice of uh, function. So um, I'm going to assume that uh, f such that x goes to r is a, uh, so x is a Hilbert manifold. And this function uh, satisfies condition c. So it's nice for doing Morse theory. And um, assume that the critical values are isolated. Are you sure? Because it would be a four, so you must 
Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not quite right. I agree. Yeah, it's not quite right. But um, sorry, you like this one better? Okay. I mean, I I, th I think it, it it it's very close to being true. I just yeah. I mean, I could I could fix up the notation to make it strictly correct, but I think it's. Uh, I think it's a good way to think about it. Um, this one, this one, it's parameterized on W again. Right? And you can use that if you want. All right, I, I'll fix it. Okay, now gamma of U tau of V, right? Yeah, that, that's okay. Such that. Uh, UV, is, it, is this right? Oh, that's right. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's good. That's better. Okay. Yeah, thanks. That's better. Not, not good. All right. So uh, we're going to assume that this is a. Uh, Simplest possible. So critical values are isolated. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, the critical sets are more spot, non-degenerate. So this means either they're actually non-degenerate isolated critical points, or else there's a submanifold of critical points, so that uh, um, the second derivative is non-degenerate on the normal bundle to the uh, critical set. Um, so in this case, uh, we get a filtration. So what Morse theory gives you is it gives you gives you a filtration of uh, the chains on X, and there's a spectral sequence. that converges to the homology of X, where the E two term is a direct sum uh, of all the, lo of the um, level homologies. So x, so I'm assuming that the critical values are isolated. Let's suppose they're a1, a2, a3. Maybe a0 is a good one. So we, these are the isolated critical values. So it's a direct sum of the, the level homologies of x less than or equal to a i comma x less than or equal to a i minus. This, this is called the level homology. It's the homology at level AI. And again, these are these are the um, the square roots of the energy, so they look like lengths. They're um, units of units of length. Um, and F is called a perfect Morse function if uh, the thing degenerates at the E two term, and if uh, so F is perfect. Morse function if uh, all the differentials are zero and E2 is equal to the infinity. And uh, so this means this is true if and all, all the connecting homo homomorphisms vanish. The connecting homomorphisms, these are maps from, let's say, H. We have these long exact sequences for, for every triple. So uh, let me do A, B, and C, because otherwise I'm going to get messed up. Less than or equal to B, X, X less than or equal to A. So let's here I have A, B, C in this order. So this maps into H, the homology of H less than or equal to C, X less than or equal to A. And then we have homology of X less than or equal to B, X less than or equal to A. And then we have, the, this is a uh, long exact sequence of this triple, and then we have the connecting homomorphism, which goes down like this. And if the connecting homomorphisms are all zero, then this guy is a direct sum of those two guys. And that's what it means to be a perfect Morse function, at least over a field, and we are over Z2. So, uh, so it's, again, it's the, it's, the, uh, it's the vanishing of these maps that makes it be a perfect Morse function. So. Yeah. 
TV. All right, TV. In, in this case, it doesn't really matter. If it's, if it's more spot, you can slice at or you can slice between. It's, it's the same thing. Otherwise, yeah, it would be an issue, but it's not. That's the, one of the nice things about this. None of those <laughs> things are issues here. All right, so, uh, all right, so in this case, uh, yeah, so in this case, th the homology is given by the direct sum of these guys. And, uh, you know, somehow it means that uh, the, critical s um, the criti critical set is sort of the minimum critical set that's required by the topology. So now the question is, how can you tell if it's, <coughs> how can you tell if uh, F is perfect? Okay, so there's this method that goes back to Morse. Um, isn't that amazing, but ultimately, you know, ill-conceived book. Uh, um, calculus of variations in the large. Um, Morse. And it's called uh, Completing Manifolds. So it's a way of telling, of, of determining whether uh, F is a perfect Morse function or not. So here's the criterion. Maybe I need more room than this. So suppose uh, we have the following. So suppose we have K, the critical set. Uh, so suppose that K is equal to uh, the critical set of F intersected the, the level 0. Just to make things simple, let it be at the level 0. And so this is an X. K is an X. And again, we're, we're going to suppose it's more spot. You could probably get away with somewhat less than that, but suppose that we have uh, um, a closed manifold. So Y is a closed manifold. And L in Y is a submanifold of index of dimension equal to the index of this critical set. And suppose we have an embedding. So phi from y onto x at level less than or equal to 0. It has to be an embedding near L. Uh, doesn't need to be in anything else, any, anywhere else except continuous. And suppose that uh, phi has the property that phi is a diffeomorphism from L onto K, so this is a diffeo. And suppose that uh, phi inverse of K equals L. So this is called a completing manifold. It's manifold Y, right? So, uh, so we're ma Y is mapping to X, and uh, L is mapping to K, right? So K is the critical set inside X, and we're sort of making an, a little copy of it over here. A nice little copy of it over here. So this is a, uh, the dimension of y is the index of k. And this might be in infinite dimension. So we're assuming that it, um, and we need one more condition. The other condition is condition that, uh, that the homology of y maps surjectively onto the homology of y mod y minus L. So this is part of the, um, this is just uh, part of the uh, exact sequence for this triple again. So we're assuming that this map is surjective. 
And the conclusion is that then the connecting homomorphism is equal to zero. So um, then the connecting homomorphism is zero. So let me draw in the rest of the, uh, let me show you why this works. So uh, again, so here we have a map. Y is mapping into X, right? And here you have, uh, so H lower star of X. Here you have H lower star of, uh, I could even say X, Zero here. Although that, well, it's not necessary. Um, well, uh, yeah, okay. So this is X. Uh, sorry. So and here's the here's the connecting homomorphism. Homomorphism. The connecting homomorphism is down here. So this is a map from H star minus one of to x less than zero. So this but this is the thing we want to show is equal to zero. So uh, if this map is surjective, then uh, these two are isomorphic, right? Because this is this is the level homology. Um, there's a little bit of a these are both copies of the level homology. Um, there are no critical, we're assuming that there are no critical points at level zero except for K, right? So anything else that appears at level zero can be, uh, can be pushed down. So if this is surjective, uh, this is an isomorphism, and that means that uh, this map also has to be surjective. Yes? Why couldn't you take y equal to L? Uh, maybe I wrote down the wrong di dimension. Um, the dimension is, oh, I should have said co-dimension, sorry. Yeah, this should be co-dimension, sorry. It should be co-dimension, co-dimension. The co-dimension is y is the index. Does that fix it? No, sorry. No. No, sorry. So um, yeah, so the pi the picture. That, uh, let me draw a little picture. Okay, so so here's here's x, right? And uh, we have a, we have a critical point of the height function here, right? The critical point, and uh, th this is a critical point of index one, right? And in this case, um, oh, this is non-degenerate. But um, so a, a completing manifold would be a one-dimensional submanifold that would make this into a cycle. Um, that's not, I mean, another example that would be um, degenerate if you, if you took the, if you took the torus, right? So, so make it um, rotation about uh, about the z-axis. Then in this case, this is a, this is a submanifold of, of dimension one. The critical set has dimension one, the maximum, right? And the index is one. And in this case, uh, so y, y would just be another copy of this torus, right? So we, it would just be, um, so y would just be a copy of the torus. Uh, it's hard to draw pictures of the, you know, the high co-dimension in 3D, but um, so, so this is the index. So L is just a copy of the critical set, and then it has co L, L has co-dimension uh, co-dimension of L inside Y the same as the index of K. Pick the top, this one here. Then there's the completing the completing manifold is the whole thing, right? Yeah. Uh, I had some I had some other examples, I, but I. I um, I'm running out of time. Is that what time it is? All right. So I, let me let me go on. Okay. So anyway, so um, uh, 
Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. It isn't actually, but the thing is I'm assuming that, uh, that uh, k, k is the only critical point at level zero, right? So if there's any, if, if y maps, I'm assuming that y is mapping onto x less than or equal to zero, right? If there's something else here uh, that's, that's mapping onto the level zero, you can just push it down by the gradient because it's not a, it's not a critical point. Okay, so yeah, I, I, did, ha I did have some examples, but... Um, Okay, so let me just say that this, this was also used by uh, Bot and Atia in a very special case. Um, here. Uh, backhand, I guess, in the... 1970s. So they ha they had uh, the following case. Um, so um, so in this so the, the case that was that they considered. Uh, so we had, they had a critical set K, and then, so N is the, is the uh, negative bundle, negative bundle. So it's some negative bundle over K. And then they had, um, so this is a critical set. And they had the situation that, so this is a negative bundle, it has a Tom class, which I'll call tau. And they had the situation that when you capped with a Tom class, that this was this mapped surjectively onto uh, the homology of the critical set. Now, for ordinary homology and, and compact manifolds, this would never happen. But in this case, they were talking about equivariant homology, and this did happen, right? So it did happen that this was always surjective, and as a result of that, you could just you just sort of get this automatically completing. Uh, manifold. So this was called, they called this a self-completing manifold. Self-completing. Uh, okay, actually, a self-completing bundle. Because if you have, if you have a bundle with, the, with this property, then you can just take, in this definition, you can just take y to be the disk bundle of n, and it works. See? It doesn't look as if it should work, but it does. Right, so... <coughs> Okay, so um, right, so I'm not going to do the example. All right, so let me go back to uh, to uh, the space in question, the path space. Uh, maybe I'll just leave this up here. Okay, so uh, so on CPN, so so we have the energy function, or F is the square root of energy function, on uh, the path space, and uh, for the standard metric on CPN, so what um, we're, we want to do more theory, so we need to figure out what are the critical points. I hope you can guess what the critical points are. The critical points of the energy function are going to be geodesics with the property that they are what? perpendicular at the two ends to real projective space, right? So uh, critical points are uh, geodesics on CPN. So, and they have to be perpendicular to RPN at zero. So here's a picture. So here's a, uh, uh, and on, on the complex projector space, all the geodesics are closed and have length pi. So um, so all geodesics 
on CPN are closed with length pi. And so we have these nice critical manifolds. More spot, spot critical manifolds. Uh, the first one is at level zero, which I will call this K naught. This is just a set of all constant paths on projective space. On R, R2, right? So this has index is zero, they're all minima. So the index is zero. The nullity is the dimension of that, right? Which is n. So what about level one? Well, it's actually a level pi over two. So um, So the next shortest critical points you can have these are level pi over two. So um, this will be the set of all. So here's a picture of RPN. These are not closed geodesics, but they're geodesics that. Um, it, it's, it's sort of half of a closed geodesic, so half a closed geodesic. So, uh, so and again, we want them to be perpendicular to RPN. So uh, let's see, there's a lot of geometry in here that are, I'm trying to condense. But um, if you have a point x in RPN, And a vector v, uh, so so x v is a unit is a normal vector, so s t s normal vector of R p n c p n. So this vector is x is in R p n, and this is a normal vector to c p n and R p n. So this is, this is a normal vector. That normal vector is v, and uh, these two det to determine a, a, um, a complex line. Complex line. L sub x v. So this is a CP1, copy of CP1. And um, so there's a there's a geodesic that leaves, and here's here's the intersection of this complex line with the real projective space is this circle, right? And uh, uh, the circle is a geodesic of length pi, and um, so, so so the geodesics that we want are ones that leave leave. This is this is R P one inside R P n. We want ones that go off perpendicular, and, and after a length pi over two, they'll come back over here. So this geodesic will go up and it'll come back down, and when it comes back down, this is this thing has length pi over two, and uh, there's a whole critical set worth of those that's parameterized by x and v. Right. So there's a critical set, critical set, uh, let's say K, K1, and it's a copy of this uh, normal bundle, so uh, Fn RPN. So for every, every, every point in, in this normal bundle, you get exactly one of these geodesics that uh, leaves RPN perpendicularly, and it will also enter RPN perpendicularly on the other side. That's, that's something that follows. It. So this is the critical set. This has index. The index of this critical set is um, 1 plus k minus 1 times n. Uh, actually, this index, <laughs> um, tw 20 years ago, I have this paper with Diane Kalish. And we, we proved the index formula in this submanifold sense, but and it, it does work. You have to be dead sober to, to use it because you have to um, know what the parallel transports are. K, 
Miss K? Um, oh, K, and I'm sorry, this is K is one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, so, and in, in particular, uh, so th there's a critical set um, with index, this, this has index one, sorry. Um, K1 has index, and there's also uh, uh, another critical set, K sub K. And so this is the one that had that index. So again, it, again it's, it's, it's a copy of this normal bundle. So it's another copy of this normal bundle, and it consists of those GDS that start at X and go off and go uh, K half circles, right? So they go <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they come back after K half circles. So, uh, and these have length uh, K pi over two, right? This, this is length pi over two, so these have length K pi over two, and this is the index that I wrote down there, sorry. So this has index uh, one plus K minus one times N. And the nullity is 2n minus 1. So when you add them together, you get the index plus nullity is equal to k plus 1 times n. Why am I interested in that? This is supposed to be the dimension of the completing manifold. So I'm looking for a completing manifold of that dimension. This thing, uh, this thing has two points. So, k plus one times n. So let me just tell you what the uh, I'm running out of time. Let me just tell you what the completing manifolds are. Um, You can define a family of circles, or the family of circles on CPN. A circle on CPN is a circle on a CP1, right? There are lots of CP1s in CPN. You find a CPN, you the circles on CP1 are the circles, are the intersections with the two sphere with a plane, not necessarily through the origin. So we have this notion of circles on CPN. And um, there's another, you can all, circles actually, this is just a cool fact, but they happen to be the same as the image under the Hopf map of great circles on the sphere. So if you take great circles on the sphere, so you have, have a map S 2N plus 1 plus CPN, right? So if you take a great circle up here, if it's a, if it's a Hopf circle, it'll map to a point, right? If it's a, if it's a if it's a circle that's perpendicular to the hop fiber, then it'll then it will um, map down to a great circle down here, and if it's something in between, it'll map down to some other circle. So we have this family of circles. Uh, circles on CPN are again they're also circles on some CP1, and uh, if we have a point X and we have a point V and we have X and V, so if X and V is in here. We get a vertical circles, a family of vertical circles. So the vertical circles, again, once you have X and V, you get a CP1. Here's the CP1. Here's the X and V. And uh, this family of vertical circles includes uh, th this one, which is the geodesic, but it also includes circles like this. So these. Uh, Vertical circles, they begin at X, they go up. Um, they're called vertical because they have th the initial tangent vector is perpendicular to this uh, um, real projective space. So this is, um, this is this, the equator is RP1. And uh, it turns out that uh, you have to, <coughs> excuse me. So um, basically, the space of vertical circles is, makes a completing manifold. 
And there's one little thing we have to do. We have to fix up uh, well, no, actually, this is, this is okay as it stands. So, um, right. So, yeah, I guess one thing that a set of vertical circles. Vertical, I guess, half circles, half circles. is a completing manifold, <coughs> excuse me, for K1. So here's a, here's a manifold. We map it into the path space, and it's the space of all vertical circles for all X and V. So it, it's, a, it's a map from uh, this unit tangent bundle, so S, Sn uh, Rpn Cpn cross S1. It's a map from here into P Pn. And it's a completing manifold, suddenly called a small. This is a completing manifold. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. In, in so this is a completing manifold for K1. And this also has the property that it's, um, it has a submersive property, right? So this, this, this cycle has a submersive property. So you can, you can also take the product of this on the left or on the right. And uh, you can, uh, um, on the chain level, you can just define the product of this. So, um, so Y, and it turns out that Y star Y is a completing manifold for K2, and Y star Y is a completing manifold, Y star Y star Y is a completing manifold for K3, and so on. So we get these completing manifolds, and uh, uh, using this, you can, you can write down, um, you can write down uh, a set of gener generators for the homology, and you can write down what the relations are. Um, Anyway, but I'm out of time, so that's it. Thanks.